you embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love, that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace, that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives, that we may protect the world and not prey on it. That we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch, our, heart, touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and of the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The choice of this topic um, is driven really by the fact that the Society of Jesus uh, has chosen four universal apostolic preferences. That's a mouthful to say. These are um, sort of uh, areas of focus for Jesuit ministries over the next 10 years. Uh, promoting discernment and spiritual exercise, walking with the excluded, journeying with youth, and caring for our common home. So those are preferences that drive, that will drive Jesuit ministries over the next 10 years. And caring for our common home, as you know, is the theme of our lecture. Uh, Father Tom Saro uh, is a professor of moral theology at Fordham University. He's a Jesuit priest of the Northeast province, and he served as professor of moral theology at the Western Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge, Mass, uh, at Boston College, at the Jesuit School of Theology at Clinton at Santa Clara, uh, where he was also the dean, and now at Fordham University. His doctorate is in Christian social ethics from Emory University. He's written nine books, over 100 publications, and most of those dedicated to Catholic social te teaching. And his most recent book, Mercy in Action, is on um, uh, the social teachings of Pope Francis. And one of the chapters in this book was precisely on our topic today, caring for our common home. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, please join me in welcoming Father Thomas Massara. Thank you, Peter. Excellent. I'm very grateful to be here uh, this weekend. I hadn't really spent much time in Charlotte before in my life, and I'm extremely impressed. You have a real skyline. <laughs> Take that from a New Yorker who sometimes gets, uh, you know, gets over, uh, over. Uh, impressed by the New York City skyline. It's a wonderful city, and I've had a wonderful uh, reception, a wonderful um, welcoming. Uh, I met members of the committee last night. The, the Kennedy family uh, are, uh, showed up in large numbers, so I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share with you uh, some reflections on what our Pope, the current Pope, Pope Francis, has done on the environment. Uh, and I'll share with you one, one more biographical uh, feature that didn't get into the introduction. For me, this is a return. Although I have not spent much time in my life in the Tar Heel State, I was born in this state. I was born on the coast at Camp Lejeune, which is in Onslow County. So I know we're a long way from there. Yeah, Camp Lejeune, go Marines. Uh, but it's, it's uh, and here's the way I think about that. I don't, my Jesuit life has called me to many states, mostly Massachusetts and New York and California, a few other places like Atlanta, not so far from here. But I, I would like to return to North Carolina about once a decade just to check up that the locals are taking care of my state. Okay? So when I so, uh, use that phrase, taking care, care for our common home. If North Carolina is 
at least for a while, first few months of my life, my home, I hope that you're taking care of this home. And by the way, on the national news, I'm a news junkie, I check the national news feeds across ecological news as well as political news, and I am quite aware that this part of the state, uh, the Mecklenburg County and the Gastonia, taking really good care of the, especially the water system here, right? A lot of flood prevention measures, a lot of attention to the wetlands, the purity of the drinking water, dams, very good care. So there's an example of stewardship, and that's a good place to start uh, in our talk. So what is the talk about? The talk has three parts, and if you have your outlines, you'll be able to follow very easily. I'll spend about 15 minutes with each of those three Roman numerals. First, the many accomplishments of Laudato Si. Secondly, a progress report on how we're doing towards developing an integral ecology for our time. We'll talk about some challenges there. And then the third part, probably the shortest, but perhaps the most creative. What will it take to get the relationships right? That's the relationships between God, ourselves, other people, and the natural environment that we all share, that we're called to take care of, okay? So it's a talk about theology, it's a talk about Pope Francis, but it's also a talk about our environment, the world that we inhabit, and I have to say, the future of the human race. We have no future if we don't take care of the land, the sea, the air that we inhabit, that we breathe, that we depend upon, all right? Uh, and just a final uh, introductory word before we get into Roman numeral one. I am so impressed that there are young people in the audience, more the better, but I see lots of young faces. That really is the wager of our future. Those of us, uh, maybe we're baby boomers, maybe we're even older than that. We have done, uh, I'd like to say a better job. We've done a mix, let's just say. We have only a mixed record on how well we've cared for our common home. We've wasted resources, we've polluted the air, and we've created this existential threat of climate change. No one generation is to blame for all that. But we're learning lessons rapidly that our next generations, I would say my nieces and nephews and their uh, children after that, you might say your grandchildren, whoever comes next, some young people, some yet to be born people, they will have to live with the consequences. And I have seen, and I'll, I'll say this later, I'm encouraged by their activism and their active engagement with these issues. That's where the future lies. And I would say Pope Francis well knows that. We'll get into that in just a moment. So let's just start right at the, at the beginning of my outline there. What are the many accomplishments of Laudato Si? Well, first I have to tell you what Laudato Si is. So popes publish encyclical letters from time to time. It's really the, just about the highest level of papal statement. John Paul II had 15 encyclicals. Pope Francis really only has two. The longest and most complicated one came out on June 19th, 2015. So a bit over four and a half years ago. He chose for the title of that letter, not just two Latin words, because they normally have Latin titles. He chose two Italian words. Laudato si is Italian. And it means, may you be praised. They're words directed to God. They're words that Saint Francis of Assisi, back in the early 1200s, wrote. When he wrote a beautiful little poem, you may have heard it, The Canticle of the Creatures. And in that poem, you've heard uh, snippets of it, he, he talks, he addresses brother sun and sister moon and many other creatures, some allegories uh, thrown in there. And the first two words of that poem are laudato si, Lord, may you be praised in all of your creatures. Pope Francis, who's fluent in Italian, by the way, as you know, although he grew up in Argentina, loved that poem. He has a good, although a Jesuit himself with Ignatian spirituality, he has a good dose of Franciscan spirituality, choosing St. Francis's name for his papal name, Pope Francis. So after several years of preparation, on June 19th, 2015, I remember exactly where I was when I uh, opened up my uh, email and started reading the text off the Vatican website of that encyclical. I was impressed then, and I'm impressed even now. When I wrote the book that Peter Judge just mentioned, The uh, Social Teachings of Pope Francis, 
Uh, the book is called Mercy in Action. My favorite chapter is the chapter I wrote on the environment, and it's largely about what Pope Francis said in this encyclical. So just quickly, I'll go through the points that um, I type into the outline. I'll expand on some of them. What were the accomplishments of that encyclical? Well, I would say, uh, to start off with, this encyclical gave us a sense of continuity with previous Catholic social teaching, things that were said by popes and bishops, about preserving the environment. Not only did it repeat what previous popes had said, it expanded upon them. Sadly, very few times in a church history, until the year 1990, had a pope or a group of bishops really spent any paragraphs or time on the environment. They kind of took it for granted. It wasn't such a big item back, you know, further back in time. But as the human population expanded, I think we went from 1 billion in 1900 to about 7 billion in the year 2000, and we're above 7 billion now, we began to take a toll on our Earth. The carrying capacity of the Earth has been stretched by the growth of human population and society, uh, plowing fields and cutting down rainforests. So gradually the church began to notice this and to adopt a message, expand its message. Pope John Paul II did a great job, starting in 1990, writing documents about the environment. It was a famous one. Um, that he wrote in uh, 1990, the US bishops in 1991 echoed that with a great letter called Renewing the Earth. Uh, Benedict XVI, you may remember the predecessor, still alive, predecessor of, of Pope Francis, wrote several long paragraphs in his 2009 encyclical, Caritas and Veritate, about the Earth. Benedict was called the Green Pope. He installed photovoltaic cells on the roofs of several Vatican buildings. He gave carbon offset money to replant forests. He did a lot of wonderful things. If Benedict is the green pope, what are we going to call Francis? We need like green to the second power. Francis has represented, with the letter that we're going to be talking about today, Laudato Si, that encyclical has surpassed anything the church has seen or done before on the environment. Okay. Um, Catholic social teaching has another additional linkage. Besides caring for the environment, it also, for over 100 years now, has cared about the poor, the materially poor. And that, by the way, includes great advocacy for worker justice, those who labor hard, blue-collar workers, those who at the bottom rungs of the labor market, barely eking out an existence. The Catholic Church has been an advocate for living wages, minimum wages, uh, organized labor, labor unions, better working conditions, benefits, all of the agenda of labor justice. Now, as we're in the 21st century, the Catholic Church, through Pope Francis, explicitly has linked our concern for the, for the poor with our concern for the environment. And I'll give you a preview of what comes later. Pope Francis has pointed to those people in all parts of the world who are low-income people, struggling, under-resourced communities. They are the ones that suffer most seriously and frequently from the effects of climate change. Millions of farmers in the low-lying areas of countries like Bangladesh, as the sea levels rise, those farmers lose their farmland. Salinic uh, water seeps in. Think of Africa, where there have been so many droughts, especially in the Sahel region on the edges of the Sahara Desert. As global climate change gets worse, those farmers face desertification, deforestation, and horrible other conditions. The changes in global uh, weather systems mean that some places get too much rain. We see flooding and storms. The Caribbean, think of Puerto Rico, think of uh, Texas a few years ago, Florida. You've had storms here. There's a team called the, the uh, Carolina Hurricanes, right? So you know a little bit about hurricanes. In increasing intensity. In other parts of the world are dry as a bone. And look what's happening in Australia with those horrible, horrific, um, forest fires, and I experienced that in California in the six years I spent there. Five of those years were 
drought years, and the forest fires in Northern California and Southern California are terrible. So the Roman Catholic Church has linked concern for the poor and concern for the environment. Pope Francis has that wonderful phrase in the middle of his letter, cry of the earth, cry of the poor. They're connected. Concern for the earth, concern for poverty in our world. A few words about the encyclical before we move to 1B, just to tell you a little bit more about it. It's very long, <laughs> my copy is pretty heavy, 40,000 words. My copy is 184 pages, 246 paragraphs, by the way. I think it's a little bit on the long side. I, I, if I had been in Rome, I would have uh, volunteered to be an editor for Pope Francis. He could have used an editor. He had good people working with him. Cardinal Turkson worked on it, and the Pontifical Council of Science worked on it. He had good advice and all, but I would have liked to have seen a trimming. I was inspired by the fact that within weeks of Pope Francis publishing that letter, in the, later in the summer of 2015, several other religious groups on the worldwide level published similar letters, especially, more specifically, on climate change. There was the Islamic Declaration on Climate Change, eight pages. There was the, the Buddhist Declaration on Climate Change, three pages. And the winner of the competition was the rabbinic letter on climate change, rabbis, two pages. Why can't we have popes that are so succinct? Uh, at first I said, oh, they're just copycat efforts. But then I read through those documents and I said, no, these religious communities, our brothers and sisters in the faith, have lots of distinctive things to say about climate change. And by the way, it's no coincidence that 2015, the summer of that year, saw the burst of religious statements. Why? because it was a few months before the famous Paris Climate Change Summit. It's called the COP, the Conference of Parties, that met at the end of 2015 in Paris to draft the most important climate change documents and negotiations that we've ever had. They meet every year, but those were specific ones, special ones, to set up some guidelines. They just met in December uh, in Madrid. The results weren't as good. Countries are backing away from their commitments. They're not really uh, putting skin in the game, as they say, the way they did in 2015. Okay? And by the way, I have, I have been on many interfaith panels. A typical college or university wants to have a rabbi and an imam and somebody representing two billion Christians in the world. Sometimes I'm that. And talk about climate change. The, um, I did one uh, just two, three months after Laudato Si came out at the University of San Francisco, another Jesuit campus, and um, I was impressed that the, that the letter had been out from oh, June, July, August, September, October, about four and a half months, and there was a rabbi, his name was Goodman, a rabbi Goodman had pretty much memorized major parts of Laudato Si and could quote them back to me. I was a little embarrassed. <laughs> Uh, I know it's in there somewhere, Rabbi Goodman. How come you know a papal document better than me? <laughs> so that's a little bit about the many accomplishments of Laudato Si. Let's uh, turn to 1B. What's the specific thing that it says about climate change? Well, in chapter one of the, there are six chapters in Laudato Si, chapter one has, is titled with a question. It's called, what is happening to our common home? And it's kind of a panorama of bad news. We're polluting this, the air, the sea, the land. We're overusing resources. And of course, the problem of burning of fossil fuels, buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, greenhouse gas effect, the melting of the glaciers, the rising of the oceans. Pope Francis, in just a short amount of time, a few paragraphs, paints that disturbing picture, culminating in paragraph 21's cry. The earth, more and more, has begun to appear like an immense pile of filth. I had never seen the word filth in a papal encyclical before. So Pope Francis sounds pretty pessimistic, but of course, he's an upbeat pope, right? He turns on a dime, and within a few sentences, he starts to register and record his typical notes of hope. Hope for change, appealing to our better angels, and I'll talk about the spirituality of caring for the earth. When I step back from reading the text of Laudato Si, with its mix of recognizing the problem, diagnosing the problem, but then of course bringing in hope, what are the bases for a better future, for a hopeful future, 
I always um, want to compare the threat of climate change, which we've only really known about for you know, a couple of decades. Compare that, those of you who are you know, middle age or, or my age or a little up from that, do, what were the other existential threats that we thought of when we were younger? If you lived through the Cold War, the US and the Soviet competition, as I did, you were no doubt worried about nuclear annihilation, the threat of an, of an atomic attack caused by a rivalry like the Cuban Missile Crisis or just by an accident. Somebody pushes a button in a silo. And I always try to make that comparison between the existential threat, the dread, the fear that we had about nuclear annihilation previous decades, although those weapons are still there, and they're still pointed at the wrong places, uh, to the uh, contem contemporary concern about climate change. I remember also growing up and seeing photos and a video on TV and the nightly news of oil spills on the beaches, places like Long Beach, California. We had one in the Gulf not long ago, the Deepwater Horizon. And that also, to me, represents a horrible situation of human exploitation of the environment, pollution, really quite deadly, threatening our ecosystem, what scientists call the threat of ecocide, killing our environment. So these are existential threats. If you are, again, if you're a news junkie like me, you may have noticed an item about two days ago where, have you heard of the doomsday clock? Back in the Cold War, a bunch of concerned scientists created this, you know, it's kind of a gimmick, but how close are we to doomsday, which they call midnight? Well, you know, at different times they said, well, we're like 11 o'clock at night, we're an hour away, metaphorically, from uh, midnight. Well, do you know that we're down to, uh, last I checked uh, last year, it was 11.57, three minutes to go before midnight, and then the, the, the scientists, they have a panel, an uh, international panel of experts, they revised the doomsday clock forward 80 more seconds. So we're now very close to 11.59. So it's a metaphor, don't get too worried, but it does call for a note of urgency. The climate change crisis on top of the nuclear threat means that humankind is very much precarious. So speaking of science, just a few words here. The Pope has convened, or all the Popes, recent Popes, have convened a group called the Pontifical Academy of Science. They also have an Academy of Social Science. And the, uh, the, the physicists, and I've met a few with them, the chemists, the biologists, contributed to the writing of Laudato Si. Pope Francis and his uh, ghost writers, his committee of writers, asked them for their advice. So, and he says several times, check paragraph 15 of the encyclical, he says, my goal, I'm a pope, I'm a pastor, I'm a theology teacher, a, re a teacher of religious principles. I am not a scientist, although I work with scientists. I am not here to replace the results of science, the findings of modern science, but I am here to report and apply the findings of scientists about the threats to our world. Okay? Throughout the encyclical, Pope Francis strikes notes of modesty. He tells you, look, I'm not a technical expert. The church is not here to settle scientific questions. That's a direct quote from paragraph 188. But it does have uh, a basis on the reliable findings of the scientific community, and we seek to apply them in a, to good purpose, to get people's consciousness aware of the problem and to energize them to address the problem. Okay. There are several paragraphs, I'll give you the numbers if you want them, paragraphs 23 to 26, paragraphs 164 to 175. Those are the ones that treat climate change directly. That's less than 10% of the encyclical. Okay. The Pope wants to primarily put the problem of climate change, pollution in general, in the context of our broad religious view, the values that we hold preserving the sacredness of God's creation. It's a gift. We are stewards of that gift, and we have an obligation to do everything we can to, to minimize the damage and to make a sustainable future. Ultimately, what any church voice, whether that's the Catholic Church, the rabbinic letter, the Islamic letter, the Buddhist letter, anybody from a spiritual background wants to call people to a sense of conversion, to be their better selves, to transcend the specifics. So the letter isn't about cap and trade policies and carbon offsets. There's not much detail in this letter, 
or in the other religious letters, but there are frequent calls for people to look into their souls, to discern and to convert, ecological conversion, a phrase that Pope Francis popularizes in this letter. That's all in line with the church's role to be a pastor of souls, primarily, but a pastor of souls who can make use of good science, good data, good rational approaches, philosophy and agendas that will shape our politics and our economics to inform public policy debates and create a better outcome. We're up to 1C of the outline now, sharing a broader vision of humanity's place within creation. I'm gonna use a couple of long words, multisyllabic words. I type them into your outline so you can look them up and have fun with them. They are tyrannical anthropocentrism, that's a mouthful, and technocratic rationality. You ready for those? <laughs> So, so on a Saturday morning, you're so good to show up, you got up early, you could be doing other things, and here's a guy using multisyllabic Latinate words, but for a good cause. The chief villain identified by Pope Francis is not, you know, uh, just the burning of fossil fuels, that's, that's a, the immediate problem. The deeper problem, the chief villain, is our human error where we put ourselves above the rest of creation, there's the word tyranny, tyrannical, and we call that anthropocentrism, putting the human, anthropos is human, in the center of creation. Who belongs in the center of creation? God, God alone. We can't usurp the role of the divine supreme author of all things. If we do, we're making a mistake. Paragraph 68 talks about that. So much depends upon how we interpret that verse of the scripture, I typed it in there, Genesis 1:28, where yes, it's in the first book of the Bible. God says to Adam and Eve, fill the earth and subdue it. How do we interpret that sentence? Does that sentence, does that command of God justify cutting down the Amazon? clear-cutting the Congo rainforest. Pope Francis identifies those two regions, Amazon in South America, Congo in Africa, as the two lungs by which the earth breathes. They take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they give us much of the oxygen because of the density of the vegetation there. Does it justify that? Does it justify all of the strip mining and all the ugliness that has turned this world into an immense pile of filth? It doesn't have to be that way. We have an enlightened view of our place in creation that we can act upon so that we don't treat every other creature as an instrument for our gratification, for our consumer goods, for our production, consumption of goods. We are an integral part of creation. We'll be using the word integral more in just a moment, which means that we don't stand above creation, stepping on it. We're part of creation. Every creature gives glory to God in its own way. Who are we to exterminate all of those species that are endangered? Who are we to threaten the world with a loss of biodiversity because of our agricultural and other uh, policies? Okay. We need to embrace our creatureliness. We are kin to all those other creatures. I know a lot of people probably have dogs and cats, and you feel like that pet is part of your family. But we're kin to all creatures, even the ones that aren't cuddly and soft and fluffy. Lizards. Uh, Pope, uh, Pope Francis goes through a whole list of, of insects and bugs and things. It, it's the only part of people uh, teaching that's ever had such a panorama of creation. Even the animals that seem fierce, ferocious, and not very lovable, they're our kin too, and we have a duty to protect them. So the way I describe this in my writings is we have shifted, hopefully, from a dominion model, we're the kings of creation, anthropocentrism, to a new model called stewardship, where we're looking out for the other creatures. That's a good move, but we need yet another move beyond stewardship which still has a sense of, you know, that we're superior, we need to move to a new model called creation-centered spirituality. Have you heard that phrase? Creation-centered. 
I believe that the publication of this letter four and a half years ago, Laudato Si, is the definitive move of the Roman Catholic Church towards a creation-centered spirituality. We're not all the way there yet. <laughs> it's a start. It's, a, it's like a manifesto. It's like the Magna Carta of creation-centered spirituality. It's going to take years, decades, to filter down to the people in the pews, but really to everybody. Let's hope it, it succeeds. The other phrase I, I just, I'll just go over quickly is technocratic rationality, and that's what I've already been talking about. Pope Francis says we need to get beyond technocratic rationality where everything is about manipulating nature, treating other creatures as mere instruments for our gratification, our mass consumption society. No. We need to have a change of consciousness, awareness, recognizing every creature, every species as a sacred thing. Some people have accused Pope Francis of being a Luddite, those people in medieval England that went around smashing machines with big uh, mallets or something and destroying all technology. Uh, I've been accused of being a Luddite by my students when I don't use PowerPoints often enough. I don't want to entertain them, I want to teach them. I can defend myself, and Pope Francis can defend himself too. He's not a Luddite. He just wants us, he appreciates technology, but don't exaggerate its its value, and don't trust only in technology, okay? So, okay, well, we, I think we have now finished Roman numeral one. We are now transitioning to Roman numeral two, which I can do a bit quicker. Um, we need to recognize the phrase integral ecology, okay? That is um, a kind of a neologism, a newish word, been used a few times before Pope Francis, because the integral ecology is the phrase which Pope Francis uses at least eight times in this encyclical, it's the title of chapter four of the encyclical, that it calls attention to the relationships that I've been talking about already. And those, the three changes we need to get there, this is two A, B, and C of your outline, are a change in global things, political and economic, a change in personal attitudes, and third, ecclesial change. That means church-based change. Okay, so first the global changes, just quickly. The Paris Accords that I mentioned from 2015 give us a comprehensive climate change agreement and we've taken one, two steps forward but a couple of steps back since then. On top of those political changes, governments, negotiating, international politics, there are also economic changes that must happen. Markets do not account for the environment. In fact, the environment is often called, environmental degradation is called a market failure. We don't consider the costs. We offload them. We, we call them externalities. Profits rule in our market-based economy. We need to have the common good check those markets. That's the basis of the economic changes we need. And Pope Francis in paragraph 190 calls us to go beyond the magical conception of the market to use markets to protect the environment and the common good. Consumerism. Consumerism, which is a, um, uh, a determinism, our behavior must change. It's damaging the earth. Okay. How about uh, 2B, the personal changes that need to happen? Well, as I've said, awareness, consciousness, that's the first step. And out of that awareness of the problem comes practical improvements to motivate some changes in our lifestyle. And Pope Francis has some nice sections there where he recommends, it's kind of folksy, he says, well, if you're cold in your house, don't turn the thermostat up, wasting more fossil fuel, burning oil, put on a sweater. That's pretty good advice. He talks about carpooling, he talks about recycling all of those wonderful things on a small scale that you can do, composting and all kinds of things, to save energy. Stop exploiting nature. Treat nature as sacred. A fancy way of saying this is, we are called to ecological conversion. Convert, be converted from a wasteful person, culture of consumption, throwaway culture we call it, to a culture of preservation. That's a metanoia, a conversion, an about face. At the root of all of this is to recognize our relationship with God and with our other creatures. Our relationship with God is a vertical one. God's up here, we're below. We also need to pay attention 
to our horizontal relationships with other people and with other species and the environment as well. The, even the inanimate things like water systems, uh, minerals, uh, the soil, all of them deserve our attention and our conversion. The great thing about this encyclical is it uses words like awe, wonder, and beauty time and time again. The encyclical inspires you. It appeals to your heart as well as your head. I'm giving you a, a plea to read the encyclical. I know it's 184 pages long. I know that less than 1% of Catholics in a recent survey claim to have read the whole thing. Even if you don't have 184 pages worth of time, read parts of it, read excerpts. They're all available. You can go to vatican.va and read the whole thing, or you can pick up snippets of it, as most people do, and that's perfectly fine. Okay. Um, good, well, let's go to uh, 2C of the outline, ecclesial changes. I'll just give you um, my view of what needs to change. And Francis says, we, he calls for a new kind of church a church that features dialogue dedicated to listening. Uh, theologians like myself call this a synodal church. Synods mean uh, it's a process of, of dialogue in the church. Any church meeting could be called a synod on the diocesan level or whatever. The Encuentro meetings of Hispanic Catholics in the United States were called Encuentro Five. that's a synod, okay? So it means walking together. Pope Francis wants us to be a church of dialogue and some of the topics we should be dialoguing on are our environment, okay? The word dialogue appears 45 times in this, in this text. There's an entire chapter dedicated to the theme of dialogue, and that includes listening. That includes listening to voices we don't always hear, the voice of the poor, the voice of the marginalized, forging solidarity with those people. You may know that about two months ago, the church had a famous, it was October actually, uh, a famous pan, uh, uh, synod on the Pan-Amazonian region. So all of the people from South America, along with some delegates from North America and Europe, got together in Rome and talked about the fate of the Amazon region, both its natural environment, the burning down of so many parts of Brazil and the Amazon rainforest, but also the people there struggling in their communities, some of them isolated without priests, without much in the way of sacraments. How can we meet their needs? Somebody called the Amazon Synod a child of Laudato Si. In other words, three or four years, four years after Laudato Si was published, we're finally getting a synod that addresses the environment and related things around dialogue in one troubled region of the world. The Amazon Synod is a child of Laudato Si. I love that. And here I would link it to the Jesuit Universal Apostolic Preferences. Uh, uh, Peter uh, mentioned that, Peter Judge mentioned that in the introduction just now. One of the four priorities of the Jesuits uh, is the environment, care for our common home. You know, there are 67 Jesuit parishes in Canada and the United States. This may be one of the most uh, high profile ones, right downtown. Uh, most of our parishes are kind of on the sleepy side kind of quiet. This one is vibrant. Let's be a leader. This is my appeal to you here locally. Do what you can. John Michalowski afterwards will talk about next steps. This is the kind of place that I'm very hopeful we can make, we can really keep alive the sense of urgency that we need to overcome indifference. Pope Francis calls it a bold cultural revolution, a change of heart, both at the individual level and the ecclesial level. Okay. So I think I have finished Roman numeral two. We are now ready for Roman numeral three. This is the shortest one, I'm at my time anyway, uh, but in the last three or four minutes. I think this is the most creative part of my talk. I've given many talks about Laudato Si, but gradually I've seen the necessity of taking that one extra step to Roman numeral three and asking the question, what will it take to get our relationships right? to make progress on the way to environmental sustainability. And the underlying belief of mine is that ecology is all about relationships. Ecology is about um, our relationship with God, I've said this before, God, our fellow creatures, and the entire ecosystem. How do we get it right? Well, I take my cue from Pope Francis 
12 times in this letter, he uses the phrase, everything is connected. Sometimes he says, all things are interconnected. Why would he say that so often? He wants to make the point that we should reject any view of society or of the earth that proposes that we are like little atoms, that we live in isolation, that we are uh, discrete realities with no obligations to the people and the systems around us, the ecosystem. No, we need to get beyond that individualism. We need to recognize the in innate connection that we have with all other things. And I just want to underline the uh, intimate connection that God has with every creature. We can easily think of God as up there in heaven, far away, not really involved in creation. Good Catholic theology, the kind you hear preached here every Sunday, I suspect, takes into consideration that God is active in history that God is involved and cares about every creature, no matter how small or seemingly in, insignificant. God is in all things. God is the within of the ground of our being. Everything is sacred in its own way and is called to give glory to God, and God animates every living thing. Keep that in mind. Fancy words for this are incarnation, Jesus became incarnate, but God's incarnate in all things. And sacramentality. Sacraments are not just what happens on, on this sanctuary at this altar or in baptism and marriage and final, um, uh, all these different uh, sacraments that we have, um, anointing of the sick, etc., confession. Sacraments are God's way of sharing God's grace with the world at all times in ways that are amazing, that will amaze us the more we think about it. Can we live out these values by our lives of compassion? Can we imitate God, a little bit that we can, by being compassionate people that include concern for all? It's a requirement of faith. It's not optional. We must care for creation if we are willing to call ourselves Christians. And since I opened on a note of the next generation, as I'm winding down here, let me just invoke the next generation. The future, the future people, whether they're born or not, whether they're just youngsters right now, or whether they're yet to be born. Pope Francis introduces a phrase that had rarely been seen before. In the fifth chapter, I believe, he refers to a, a term, intergenerational solidarity. Intergenerational solidarity. We have inherited many great things from the preceding generations. As you walk around this downtown Charlotte area, you see some of the oldest buildings. We didn't build those. Our grandparents, great-grandparents, way further back to the 1840s or something, uh, built those buildings. We're aware that we inherited it. What will our descendants inherit from us? Will it be a world that's hanging by a thread because we've destroyed the environment and climate change is threatening life? Or will it be a world of sustainability? where we figured out how to use technology appropriately to be sustainable and not to destroy the very uh, ecosystem that gives us life. So intergenerational solidarity. And what is the proper style? Uh, I'm just at the end of my time, so I'm not going to go into this. But I would invite questions that, um, and I'm sure you grapple with this too, and if I can be a resource for you in the next hour or so. What is the proper approach, the proper style, the words we should choose, the actions we should choose, but also the underlying attitudes that we should choose on our way to doing what Pope Francis calls us to do? During the break, we're going to have a little uh, break for the next few minutes. Think about, I brought one prop. This is my only prop. Who's this lady, 16, now 17-year-old Swedish young lady on the cover of Time magazine a month ago? That's Greta Thunberg, you all know who she is, a climate activist, teenager, that's the intergenerational solidarity. Think about her style. She's very bold, right? She doesn't mince any words. She might be a little bit accusatory. She might be a little bit overly prophetic for some people's taste. You can justify what she says, or you can attack her for being too stringent or too strict, okay? It's, I have to say this, it's a different style from Pope Francis, 
right? He's more affirming, more optimistic, more, yeah, yeah, there's less of an edge to Pope Francis. During the break, as you write your questions, I would certainly welcome questions on this. I don't have all the answers, but I'll share my thoughts. What style do you think that you personally should adapt? That our Roman Catholic Church here in Charlotte, US, global level, should adopt? Uh, some of you are Jesuits. What attitude should the Society of Jesus, a religious order that runs this church and many others, uh, and, and universities, what should we adapt? What's our role? But also, what's our style? What is the appro appropriate way to appeal to these standards? The most important thing to do is to move from ideas to action so that we don't get stuck in what I call paralysis by analysis. I'm a professor. I could spend my whole life spinning ideas and writing and writing, but what about activism? That's what I hope a, a, a wonderful activist parish like this can do before it's too late. So I think that is, have I gotten through my outline? Did I promise anything on my outline that I didn't deliver? Uh, if I didn't, that's perfectly good uh, fodder for the question and answer period. And let me close by, again, thanking you, not just for the invitation for me to come here, uh, on this long list, I was so impressed reading the 19 previous uh, Kennedy lecturers. I know about half of them as either colleagues or friends or at least acquaintances. I've read the writings of many of them. Uh, honored to be in that group. But I also noticed that the selection of the people have really brought out the deepest questions about the place of the Catholic Church in the wider world, right? They're all addressing questions, whether it's race, or religious discrimination, you had a, a Muslim scholar last year, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, it's about creation or it's about social change, political justice or economic justice. In their own way, all of the previous distinguished Kennedy lecturers addressed problems that we have something, as people of faith, uh, whether it's Catholic or some other faith, we have something to say and to add to societies solutions to these problems. None of the solutions come quickly. None of them are ever a once and for all, it's a one-off thing, and we've solved that problem. Our problems tend to be infinitely complex, and yet this should not deter us. It doesn't deter Greta Thunberg, and it certainly does not dissuade Pope Francis from issuing his bold call for ecological uh, conversion, for integral ecology, and for addressing the needs of our world. So thank you very much. How, is that a little bit better? Yeah. Okay, I'll keep doing this. So um, in markets, supply and demand, people supply things, other people buy them, consumers and sellers. The problem is that some of the exchange causes cost that nobody is bearing. Environmental degradation that comes from mining, extractive industries, well, any production where there's effluence, uh, 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 chemicals that get dumped in the Catawba River, chemicals that go up into the atmosphere. Those are costs, economists call them externalities, that are imposed upon the environment, but a company doesn't have to pay that cost. The bill never comes, okay? So uh, we are all free riders if we participate in an economy as buyers or sellers or consumers that doesn't, um, what's the word, uh, quantify those costs and pay it. 
That's why you hear about the experiments. California had this when I lived out there with cap and trade. Companies that put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, they burn coal or oil or even uh, natural gas. They are uh, measured and they are taxed if they, um, you know, if they uh, put this into the atmosphere. And if they lower their consumption, they find a scrubber, way to clean out the effluents, then they get a tax incentive for that. If they increase their, and then they could sell their allowance to another company. Uh, so it's an amazing incentive system attempting to get rid of the free rider problem, okay? That's all economics language. Let me be, put my theological hat on. That's the major hat that I wear uh, for a minute. What do theologians call it? Ever since the time of St. Thomas Aquinas, 13th century, when he borrowed all these great phrases from the Greeks, Aristotle, the common good. Uh, in Greek, it's symphoron. In Latin, it's bonum cum commune, the common good. St. Thomas Aquinas kind of baptized that as a theologian and started talking about our obligation to care for the common good. He couldn't anticipate carbon dioxide problems 800, 800 years later, but we can apply his tools, the common good, obligation to care for the common good. We can update that. Aggiornamento is the Vatican II Italian word for that. We're updating those old tools, that old moral analysis of the ethics of the common good, and we can make that the basis for our advocacy as people of faith, our advocacy for corporate responsibility around global climate change. Okay, so it's kind of a long-winded answer using theology and economics to basically say we have a free rider problem, we, we have ways of addressing it, cap and trade policies, carbon incentives, carbon reduction incentives, but very few places have put them into effect. Final, final uh, para paragraph. Pope Francis didn't want his encyclical, Laudato Si, to be primarily about public policy, like cap and trade. He could have put a whole chapter, or he could have made 80% of the letter be about the benefits of implementing cap and trade, the way California has, it's the only US state, and the way, I'm gonna guess Switzerland, Sweden, there's countries in Europe that have had it, experimentation. Uh, he didn't want his encyclical to be that technical. And so I think I said less than 10% of the letter is about that. Maybe that's a wise decision because it's an encyclical. <laughs> it's not a public policy white paper, right? That comes from think tanks in Washington and other places. So I am so proud that Pope Francis didn't get involved, bogged down in the details. In fact, he expresses some... Uh, what's the word, incredulity about cap and trade. He says the more important thing than any one policy, incentives, et cetera, is to see the big picture. And that's what he gave us in Laudato Si. Okay, how did I do, all right? Um, I'm gonna combine um, the two top light questions here together with one that's been written down. So um, the, the written question, is there a parish formation The, other, the two others from here, what is, what's the first next step for us here that we can start today or this week? What are examples, and the other one, what are examples you've seen of parishes who are taking action to influence change in their communities? All slightly different, but kind of related. And I would say that what Father John was talking about before is certainly one of our first next steps. Okay. Yeah. No, I like the idea of steps, gradualism, not everything's going to happen at once. There's no out of the box, you know, like add water and stir parish program to do this. If there was, I think I would know about it. Uh, I'll t uh, so I'll tell you about some resources. If you go to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops.org, USCCB.org, they have an entire section of their website, the Bishops Conference website. It's run out of Washington with resources for social justice. And the largest single unit of social justice is about environmental justice. 
So go up there, see what's there. You know, things like for, uh, Father Jim Parrish, bulletin inserts and things like that. But there's some more ambitious things there. Um, I will let me talk about the only program that I participated in because I have, a, I have three full-time jobs at Fordham University. I only go to a parish about once a month. I, I'm not that involved in parish life. But I will say this. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I was invited to fly all the way to San Diego, by the way, to uh, give a thing. Has anyone ever heard of Catholic Climate Change? CCC. So it's a national organization. It's led by a, a very wonderful man, Dan Misla, and one of the uh, sub-directors is my former student. Very proud of Dan DeLeo. So they, a very small office, is about four people, and they try to spread uh, proposals like this. Okay, how can parishes, they have a program, it's not in a box though, they have programs that you can plug into. My very modest contribution was I went to the Diocese of San Diego where a very wonderful bishop, and I've known him for years, Robert McElroy, I call him Bob, before he was a bishop I knew him as Bob. So Bishop Robert McElroy had uh, convened, he tried to get every priest and deacon in his diocese into a room and you get the most of them anyway, 50 or 80 of them were there, and hear a talk by three experts, I was one of the three experts, on preaching Laudato Si in the parish, okay? So it was a day-long exercise. By the way, San Diego's a lovely city, come and visit, it's lovely, year-round temperatures in the 70s, uh, but uh, I believe that those priests and deacons were exposed to, there was a scripture expert, which I'm not, I'm a social ethicist, I added that, and then there was a pastoral outreach, an old Monsignor from the state of Maine. He had the longest trip, Maine to San Diego, that's really far. Uh, and I suspect he burned a lot of carbon flying there. I felt bad yesterday flying into Charlotte knowing that I was burning carbon, but uh, Greta took a boat across the Atlantic. I am not doing that. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, that was a program. That was a pilot program. That was a year and a half ago. I don't know if they've had more. Four dioceses agreed to that. So that's a small thing. Let me mention one more program. Who knows the letters L-E-E-D? Leadership in Environmental and what's the other E stand for? Something design. Uh, energy. Energy and environmental design. So the lead, it's a board of people who certify architectural projects, whether they're new constructions, there's a lot going on. This is the city of cranes. I think your state bird is a crane. <laughs> That's a joke. Okay. It's a pun. Uh, and they certify buildings, including, including church buildings. Are you lead certified, Jim? Uh, come on, get out. Baltimore. The Baltimore. What we built in Baltimore yeah. is... Jim was the uh, provincial who started this huge construction project by Jesuit standards, very small actually, uh, in Baltimore. Uh, I, was part of, I was part of a new Jesuit community on the edge of Boston College campus. It's actually in Brighton, Massachusetts. I was the first person to move in there. And we got LEED certified. And I have to say, it cost us some money. We had to spend some extra money on building materials that were, they weren't secondhand, but they were harvested, the wood was harvested in an environmentally appropriate way. So it cost us some money. The buildings were better than they would have been otherwise. They take advantage of passive solar aspects, is a big thing, right? So I'm no scientist, but I could see the advantages even though it cost a little more. So I've given you a scatter shot there. I'm no expert on the details. Let me steer you though to did anybody ever go on the website of National Catholic Reporter, NCR? It's just uh, is it ncronline.org, okay? It's a Catholic press, independent, it's lay run, not, not by Jesuits or Dominicans or anybody. It's in Kansas City, excellent website, and they have a subsection, all Catholic news about this and that and that, but one of them is called Earthbeat. And every, every couple of days, it seems, I, I get uh, email notifications, pushes. There's a new article we just posted about Earthbeat. It's usually success stories of Catholic parishes. There was even one about a monastery somewhere. And there was a church in Toronto that was just featured recently that have implemented lead uh, environmentally aware construction and rehabbing of buildings in line with the environment. So those are little pieces. Oh, and by the way, that Catholic Climate Covenant group, Dan Misla, is very excited about a program where they will fund, they have a, a little pot of money, they will fund a parish, give them seed money so that they can do 
eco projects like composting. Actually, the biggest one is the lighting. Is your lighting the right LED type? <laughs> if it's not, you want to go with efficient lighting. You, you really want to uh, take the maximum lumen. I took physics in, I had a full head of hair when I took physics. <laughs> you want to get the lumens per kilowatt hour to be the max. So some kind of lighting is better than other. Don't ask me any more questions about science. Okay. <laughs> How do we convince climate deniers to place more emphasis on sustainability in our lifestyle, our public policy, and the other one is similar? How does one dialogue with those who think climate change is a hoax? Why am I remembering my Thanksgiving meal with all of my family? <laughs> Every family has somebody, in my case it's my uncle, who is a climate change denier, and I have never had success, <laughs> at least one to one. Maybe, in my, maybe someone read something I wrote and maybe it helped change their mind this much. But, uh, so that's a problem. Okay, let's, let's name the problem. You know the Rorschach inkblot test? People look at these dots, psychologists use this, right? A dot, you're a psychologist. They look at dots and they see different things. So you can look at the, the data, the large amount of data suggesting that the warmest decades on Earth are the last few. In fact, the most, the three or four warmest years on Earth's Earth scale were the, the last few years, okay? So there are people who attribute this to the natural cycles of the Earth. Yeah, we've had ice ages and warming ages, but the evidence is so strong to correlate the human economic activity, the burning of fossil fuels, with the increase in temperatures. And we know that if it goes past, is it two degrees Celsius, uh, more ice in Greenland and Antarctica is gonna melt at a faster rate that can never be replaced. So uh, the science suggests these things, uh, and, but some people like an ink blot look at it and don't recognize the same thing. I have no magic solution to that. I've lost all my arguments with my uncle. Um, so I just believe Remember my part of my talk about dialogue? Pope Francis, dedicated to dialogue, uses the word dozens of times, has dedicated his papacy to the goals of mercy and dialogue. Those are about the two biggest summaries. So keep talking, keep engaging, don't give up on people, don't write them out of the book of life, as we sometimes say. Um, maybe the next thing you say could be the thing that persuades them. So I wish they were more easily persuadable because don't forget, action proceeds from thought, consciousness. First you change people's awareness and consciousness that a problem exists. Only then can actions spring from that consciousness. That's a model of human behavior that's pretty reliable. And if you're not persuaded that there is a problem, then you won't do anything to address the problem. Do you, my question is, what percentage of the American people are leaning towards climate change denial, and is the trend on our side? I don't really know the answer to those questions, but I have a sense, especially, so I teach 18 to 22 year olds. I get a sense that, I take little polls in my class sometime, I get a sense that every one of those 20-somethings knows, recognizes, and cares about climate change. It's their future, after all. They have a big stake in this. I, I, you know what I worry about? Young people, I have eight nieces and nephews and only one of them, uh, they're all uh, almost childbearing age or above. Yeah, most of them are in their 20s and 30s. Only one of them so far has had a baby. Do they, does that, I, don't, I can't ask them this question. I can volunteer to baptize any babies they have. I did one, I did the only one I, opportunity I had. But I want to know whether their hesitation, usually it's deferred babies, rather uh, childbearing, rather than uh, saying an absolute no. But smaller families and some childless couples don't want to have children. And I think in the back of their mind is, they're worried that the world that their child will be born into and raised will be inhospitable. And that's social inhospitality, including economic inequality. But I think in the back of their minds is ec ecological inhospitality. 
That's, that's, so uh, we worry about these things. I can't solve them, you can't solve them, but let's keep dialoguing, and I, that's what Pope Francis would want us to do. Wait, is it state capitals? I'm really good on that. <laughs> Raleigh, <laughs> Albany, Carson City. Could you talk more about creation-centered spirituality? What do you, um, uh, what, uh, sorry, what does this look like? Where do you see it emerging within and outside our church? Creation-centered spirituality. Yeah, uh, so how important is this? So I gave you the simple sketch of dominion. Remember Genesis 1.28? Take over the world, subdue it, okay? To transition to stewardship, where our domination of the earth is mitigated by our care for other creatures. We balance self-regard, anthropocentrism, with other creature regard, whatever that's called, geocentrism, maybe. And then I did I point a little kind of a gestured towards the third stage, which is creation-centered spirituality, sometimes called deep ecology, okay? Well, first of all, I am surprised as a theologian, and I've looked at the theological texts from every era of church history, that's what we do in seminaries, I taught in seminaries for over two decades, and I was surprised at how late a development this is Mystics are the ones who got the message earlier. People with a sense of direct connection to God, Saint uh, Teresa of Avila, Saint John of the Cross, um, you know, all those great mystics of the era. And I wanna throw in the founder of the Jesuits, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, who lived 1491 to 1566 or so, uh, so 16th century figure having a sense of the sacredness of creation. He didn't write a lot about other species, but he gave us a tool, discernment, okay? It's one of the Jesuit priorities, the four universal apostolic preferences, uh, an awareness of everything is a gift from God. And you all know the big phrase that he borrowed, uh, well, that he used, AMDG, ad maiorum dei gloriam. That's the motto of the Jesuits. If you really want to give greater glory to God, don't limit that glory to the advancement of one species, the human species. Even though we are at the summit of creation, we're still surrounded and part of all the other creatures. We're akin to others. So to do greater glory to God is to advance every species. If a species of frog died out, you and I might not notice it. But in theological terms, one avenue, one conduit for giving glory to God has been chopped out, okay? Species, the loss of species diversity is advancing at a very alarming rate. And a theologian would say, it, Thomas Aquinas said this in so many words, that's the, uh, every species gives glory to God in its own way. So that's a creation-centered spirituality. It's dethroning the human race. Artificially, we set ourselves up a little too high, I think, okay? So that doesn't mean that we treat every animal like a human person. It doesn't mean you have to be vegan, but it means that you need to feel the kinship with other species because they're in a relationship with God as well. That's the part that we were missing. We didn't acknowledge for centuries of theology, millennia, the relationship of even the lowest species to God. And those were the two words that I saved to the near end of the talk. Incarnational theology and the sacramentality principle. If you're a Roman Catholic and you're talking to Protestant friends, dialoguing, bring those two things out. If they say, what's so great about your church? Basically your answer should be our church and your churches, if they're Presbyterian or Methodist or Congregational or Episcopalian, Lutheran, we agree on so much, the Trinity and so many things. But our church has a style of talking about the world, about God, God's universal salvific destiny for all people, the will of God, that, in that includes these themes, incarnational and sacramental, 
which those churches don't deny, but we're like, we're like, uh, we're beefed up on those two. We're ripped <laughs> because we emphasize when we gather around this altar, I'm so glad we're in a church. When we gather around this altar, we're celebrating God, the God man, God's incarnating in the person of Jesus Christ. And we believe that the real presence of Christ is with us in a sacrament. I'm not saying that our seven sacraments are the same as a walk through nature, but I am gonna say that your experience of the natural world, uh, some theologian said this, it's like the two books of Revelation. The Bible is a book of Revelation, the revealed word of God, but God speaks to us and reveals God's self when you get out in nature and you take a walk, or I've never done it, but what is that called? It's deep sea dive, scuba diving. Someday I want to do this. Go to a coral reef off Belize or someplace, and you see a world that you never knew was there, and God preceded you there. So that, uh, that's my most poetic I'm going to get here, okay? That is a picture of a, of a creation-centered spirituality that's a nice idea, and it's a prayer experience. But then our moral and ethical obligation is to carry those ideas and feelings and prayers into action. So the questions about activism were, uh, were, were a balance to this question about spirituality. The Jesuits were, were very clever. We want everybody to see the necessity of practical action in the world. There's another Ignatian theme, the practical changing the world. We call it structural transformation. And we don't hit you over the head. I don't know, some of your priests probably do. I don't hit my students over the head, but I want to lead them to a place where they see the same priorities and in the case of Pope Francis on the environment, the urgency of this action. Okay, and I know there's a question about Greta. Is that the next one? Uh, no. I got some likes. Okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, since you mentioned it, yeah. oh. <laughs> uh, I did get a good number of likes. Greta Thunberg is getting the attention of the world, more so than anyone else. At nearly 11.59 on the doomsday clock, isn't it time to be confrontational? And there was another um, comment here about uh, not really a question, but a much, uh, in terms of approach style. Um, univocal truth talk, avoidance of endless talk and debating, uh, but a kind, unattacking like uh, approach. Yeah. So how do we balance those? Ideas? Balance is the key word. Thanks for that word, Peter. Um, so yeah. I think there's two kinds of people in the world, those who divide people into groups and who, those who don't. No. There's two kinds of people in the world. There are the very direct people, right, who speak the truth and let the chips fall where they may. And then there's people who are, let, you know, let's try to win over people. I'm in the latter category. Pope Francis is in the latter category. Where's Greta? First category, okay. Is there room for both in the climate change uh, opposition movement? Yes, of course. Okay? So on some days, you may wake up on the side of the bed that's confrontational. Maybe you read a news story about, I don't know, the death of species or the burning in Australia or the Amazon, and it just gets you mad. I hope you have some days like that. I do. If you don't get a little prophetic denunciation, a little bit of deep concern and itching for immediate action, then the blood isn't flowing to all parts of your brain. You should get that sometime. But then step back, count to 10, take a deep breath, and say, how am I going to interact with people around me today in a way that will model good dialogue, but firm, what, what's that phrase? An iron fist and a velvet glove, okay? So I'm the velvet glove guy, Greta's the iron fist woman. I think there's room for both of us. Well, what was the other saying? Uh, I'm full of cliches this morning. You catch more flies with honey than with vinegar, okay? So if you want to persuade those climate change deniers, try to go in their door. This is St. Ignatius. Enter their door and try to pull them out your door where you're, you lead them to a place where they're more receptive, okay? But I, 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 do, I never want to say any sentence that will give people an excuse for apathy. Okay, don't be apathetic. Don't communicate apathy. Uh, Pope Francis 
always talks about overcoming indifference. Very often it's indifference to the plight of the poor, okay? He has this phrase, the culture of the throwaway. We just throw things away. And that includes disposable razors. I don't use many myself, but disposable things, but also people are treated as disposable. Low-wage low workers in foreign countries who stitch our sneakers and T-shirts that we don't care enough about them to guarantee that they get a living wage. People who raise our coffee and we don't spend the extra pennies per cup for, um, is it called, uh, fair trade coffee. So those are the throwaway people that we should be caring about. Pope Francis says, get over the indifference indifference to low-wage workers, indifference to refugees, climate change refugees, people fleeing Bangladesh, the lowland farmers for other places, becoming refugees. Um, so get over that, but don't do it in a way that is, that will turn off people. I worry that Gret is turning people off. You worried about that? Well, I, I, somebody sent me a link to her talk in Madrid, no, Davos, the World Economic Forum, just last week, and I started playing it and I had to turn off the speakers. I read the rest of the, te the text was good, but it was, she was a little bit too strident for my taste that day. Other days I would listen to the whole thing. So that's where I am. I, maybe some of you are a little bit more eager to play the prophet and take no prisoners, prophetic denunciation. Uh, keep stirring the pot. Even if you're like me, you wanna smooth things over and make a smoother presentation that wins those flies with honey. So you kind of touched on this just a little bit. So here are uh, two more of the top, <clears throat> top questions uh, that I'm going to combine. Isn't our basic economy unsustainable? It depends upon more and more consumption to drive GDP growth. This creates a collision course with the environment. Um, a big part of the climate issue is overconsumption of resources caused by population. How does the institution address population? Yeah. It was criticized for not addressing population. In fact, when I read newspaper accounts as soon as it came out, the two criticisms were it doesn't fully embrace cap and trade, it expresses some uh, reservations, and it doesn't address the population crisis. So the, the, the history of the Roman Catholic Church and population issues is a very long and fraught one. Those of you old enough to remember Humanae Vitae, the 1968 encyclical where Pope Paul VI, ignoring the advice of the primary, of the majority of his committee on, on uh, population and birth control, said we are not going to allow artificial contraceptions. And of course, people concerned about population growth uh, have been jumping on that ever since. And usually the Re Vatican, who's a, a party to many international uh, covenants and agreements, usually agrees with almost all of the social justice initiatives, the whole community, we're, we're on board with poverty reduction, et cetera, et cetera, re economic responsibility. But we usually, the Catholic uh, delegates uh, from the Vatican, usually demur or fail to agree on the one about population control. Okay, so it's a long history. I'm not gonna solve it. I don't even know what the answer is. Here's the elements of an answer though. Put it together yourself. One, the question is, what is the carrying capacity of the earth? Okay, there was a time when we thought that if we went over two billion people, there would not be enough farmland to feed those people. What changed? The green revolution. We discovered new seeds, new farming techniques. It includes pesticides and other things that, uh, uh, if you've used Roundup, I hope you join the class action suit that's going on. So we're, we've learned some hard lessons and the movement towards um, organic farming is a very good one, okay? We need to keep looking at those things. So the carrying capacity of the earth is not fixed as we once thought it was. There may be an upper limit but it, clearly we have not reached the upper limit yet. I don't know what the upper limit is. I'm not, I'm not sure that anybody has a good estimate. Uh, is it nine billion people? I don't know, okay? So that's, what, that's in the deep background of all the questions about the economy. Here's, an, here's a fact number two. An American uses many times the resources, energy resources and other natural resources, than the average person on the globe. 
okay? I have a housemate from Indonesia, and we compare lifestyles. I've never been to Indonesia. We compare lifestyles, and from everything he tells me, if it, unless he's lying to me, the average Indonesian hardly burns any fuel in the course of a day. And we've got, well, they, they live in a, a, what's called tropical climate, so they don't need house heating, but they don't use much paper, they don't, they don't have many cars, so it's an amazing thing. They pedal places, I'm a bicyclist too, but not like they are, it's amazing. So how many Americans lifestyle people could be sustained on the earth? Not as many as the average Indonesian person's lifestyle, okay? So if, if, Amer if, the newly developing middle classes in China and India, those are the largest ones, and other countries, tr aspire to a USA cons high consumption lifestyle, we will reach the carrying capacity of the earth very quickly and exceed it. If they live like Indonesians, we're okay for a while, okay? So that's my analysis, it's not very scientific, it's anecdotal, but those are the elements of what, it, what goes into it, okay? So, are there any parts of that question I didn't address? No, I think consumption. I also want to acknowledge that there is another question here that's very similar, okay. and that got a number of likes, so I didn't mean to ignore that. <coughs> it could be combined. Another one about consumption worded just a little bit differently. Here are the next three um, that are pretty similar, related. Um, so first, the church does not hesitate to take political stands on abortion. Why does it not address the impacts of climate change made by this current administration? Uh, how do we as a church respond to a leader and supporters who on one hand support pro-life while simultaneously rolling back the PDA and endangering migrant children? Uh, and then there was another one. Oh, um, <coughs> International governments are moving too slow in reacting to climate change. Corporations need to drive needed changes. Um, what can the church do to actively influence corporate leaders? Yeah. Let me do corporations first and politics second. Okay. And they're both really good questions. I've, I've worked on both for a long time. Uh, on the corporate thing, there are good things happening in what's called the investor responsibility community. There are nonprofit organizations. Uh, I've lived many years in New York and in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and both cities seem to be uh, uh, centers for, uh, there's boards that do socially responsible investing. Some of those uh, panels and boards, they're nonprofits, put together indices. If you are a mutual fund or you're, uh, say you're a hospital system with some money to invest, what is the appropriate portfolio of stocks in which you should invest or bonds, okay? Try to avoid, if you're a Catholic, you try to avoid anything to do with, um, you know, uh, violence. <laughs> We're against violence, so don't invest in defense industries. Uh, uh, and maybe that includes drug companies that feed the opioid. So making, ethically responsible investment decisions across the board, how you're going to invest your money. Georgetown University has had student groups, uh, you were still there when that was happening, I think, right, in, in the uh, capital area, where the students are so eager to, for the uh, Georgetown University's endowment fund to divest of fossil fuel investments that they've staged sit-ins in the president's office, and, and I think that's really good. I've actually uh, supported them in some ways. My friend John Carr is still working on that issue on the Georgetown campus. M many colleges have that. So there's a corporate thing. Ah, one more. I'm going to say a good word about John Jenkins, who's the Holy Cross Father, CSC is the abbreviation, who is the president of Notre Dame University. Even though I root for Boston College football team to defeat Notre Dame, they sometimes do. Uh, I have to tip my hat to Father Jenkins has convened twice now, once it was in Rome, uh, convened corporate leaders from around the world to try to get them on, to sign on to a real pledge, uh, and there's no enforcement mechanism, but to pledge their support for reducing climate change through divesting from fossil fuels. Okay? That's banking industry, investment industry, et cetera. That's a model. Uh, I'm not aware of any Jesuit school that's done as much as University of Notre Dame. Go fighting Irish, except when you're playing Boston College. Okay. 
So those are some religion and corporate investment. In general, the corporate community needs to be nudged. Is that a pretty fair statement? Very few people leave profits on the table, okay? Without, um, without some prodding, maybe it's an a investor, um, what do they call those things? Uh, at the investment meetings, you make a share, shareholder resolutions. Without those, no pressure will come to the CEOs and the board of trustees of these big corporations, whether they're fossil fuel, ExxonMobil, et cetera, or banks, you got Bank of America here, uh, to change their policies, because it's going to cost them something, okay? So that if the market is just about cost-benefit analysis, the environment will continue to be an externality, and there'll be free riders. We need to operationalize some cost or incentive structure to change that, and investment seems to be the, 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 the way in. It's like a, like a silver bullet that gets you to do that. On the politics thing, so, okay, the general topic is religion and politics, church and state, okay, Re uh, religion and society, okay. So the age-old question, it goes back to the time of Jesus. Remember Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, unto God what is God's. So as Christians for 2,000 years, we've been grappling with the right balance. In the United States with a First Amendment, remember the First Amendment of the Constitution? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise of religion, okay? So we have the right to speak, free exercise. Sometimes our speech is about things that are churchy, we evangelize, but sometimes the implications of evangelization have social, economic, and cultural implications. So we can be advocates. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, it's located at 3211 4th Street Northeast in Washington, uh, they have lobbyists, there's four of them uh, last I checked, who go down to Capitol Hill every day, they ride the red line I think, uh, unless they have parking, it's hard to park there, and they go to Congress offices, senatorial offices, and they advocate for things like, you know what they are, better poverty reduction programs, okay, more generous social benefits, care for workers, okay, uh, sometimes those get a little dicey because they have to do with pro-life. It's no secret, the church, in fact, in November, the bishops issued a statement, it's their pre-election statement, where they continue to use the phrase, for better or worse, take your pick, um, the priority of the pro-life agenda. Is it that phrase, the priority? Anyway, they put it in first place, okay? Other people are more eager, and frankly, I'm one of them, to as, as highly as we regard the pro-life movement and protecting unborn life, standing with the unborn, as the title of a document the Jesuits published in 2003, as much as, as important as that is, uh, we need to have a broader agenda that includes other issues like the ones we've been talking about. I have no interest in listing them in, well, one document put the issues in order, abortion it starts with an AB, so it made first place, that's okay, that's fine. Other documents, though, that I've seen from bishops seem to eclipse all the other issues. They're all in the back seat. And that's problematic. I think about what that means. We want a baby to be born. <laughs> We're willing to expend a lot of energy. But once it's born, oh, it's your own problem. Find food stamps yourself. You know, we're not going to put any money into those programs. That's a terrible thing. Okay? And by the way, being against war, as, we, as the Catholic Church is, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, the, um, our peace agenda should be included as our pro part of our pro-life agenda. Cardinal Bernardin said this so well 30, 40 years ago with his consistent ethic of life. So I, I, I'm eager to return to that, and I don't think Cardinal Bernardin had much place for environmental uh, concern in his agenda. It should be there. So some Catholics are a bit um, almost <laughs> allergic to the church having a public face, getting involved in politics, I am not allergic to that at all, and the, most bishops are not. I just want to make sure that our engagement with issues, never candidates, never proposing a, this candidate should win or that party should win, but when we talk about values and the issues that those values intersect with, we should make sure that all the issues are there, okay? I have, I have members of my family that are single-issue voters. That's my Thanksgiving fun. 
around the dinner table. And, you know, and they're very sincere, and I, they are good people, and they are very laser focused on the pro-life issue, and I affirm them, but I want, the, I'm eager for them to have a broader agenda, and I certainly want that agenda to include environmental issues. So when they go to the polling place, they have in their heads all the right ideas, not just one right idea. Okay? So it's, it's hard, but it can be done. <laughs> it can be done well. There is another question here, in fact, about um, from folks who are from other parishes uh, that's kind of related, and maybe we can end with this. We're past 11 o'clock, so just an additional comment. Um, taking this back to our parishes, and how do we convince our pastors that this is, in fact, a pro-life Good. So linking these issues is a great thing to do. In fact, in a sense, the linkage between faith beliefs, uh, which includes pro-life, and the practical issues of environmental um, sustainability, that's, that's the task of the day. I call that connecting the dots. The dots are laid out there. They're just begging to be connected. It's like when you see the Big Dipper in the sky and you go, oh yeah, I could see it, it's so obvious. Let's make the obvious real. So. I believe always in starting small, step by step. There's a Latin word for that, paulatim, step by step. Pope John the 23rd, good Pope John, now saint, uh, used to use that phrase all the time. Little by little, the church makes progress. Actually, he did big by big, because he's the pope that called Vatican II. So it's time for big steps, but even be satisfied with the little ones. That's why I love those folksy segments uh, of the Laudato Si encyclical. Put on a sweater, um, you know, uh, recycle. Do the um, uh, composting in your garden. Th that's the practical stuff that Pope Francis is so good at. I love the story that he used to walk across the Plaza Mayor, where the papal, uh, I'm sorry, the archbishop's residence was at one side. He didn't even live in the archbishop's residence. He lived in a tiny little apartment somewhere. But the, his offices were there. His paper was delivered with a newspaper, the newspaper with a rubber band. And he, once a week, he would gather the seven uh, rubber bands, walk them across the Plaza Mayor, and hand them to the news dealer just to save that much rubber every day. Okay? So I'm trying to be more like Pope Francis. I, um, I, my courses are paperless. Students can access things online. Blackboard is a website. But they don't get lots of reams of paper. I want to don't cut down any trees. So I believe that those little measures as modest as they seem, have a momentum, create a consciousness. You save a few trees, but while you're planning, when, when I'm planning to restructure my entire course away from paper and towards uh, posting things online, it's changing me. I have a new mindset. I'm using whatever brain cells are available to strategize to save the environment. And those same brain cells I use when I preach, uh, to include the environment in my um, sermons. I, I, was, I was teaching all the priests in San Diego, encouraging them to do that, so I figured, look in the mirror, do it yourself. Those are the kinds of things. So again, I don't have an out-of-the-box strategy for a parish. I love Father John Michalowski's idea of having, starting small with groups, you talk about it, talk precedes thought, thought precedes action, action on the small scale precedes action on a big scale. You're not gonna change the world overnight, but our little things do make a difference, and they trickle up. I love that. My theory of church teachings used to be more trickle down. Pope says something, we do it. Might be a couple of steps in between. Bishop's conference, diocese. No, I really believe the more I study Catholic social teaching, the history of Catholic social thought starting in the 19th century with local workers' movements in Mainz, Germany, and Paris, it actually social concern trickled up. The Pope Leo XIII issued the first social encyclical in 1891 because people had been lobbying him for decades to incorporate worker justice into some papal statement. That was the Big Bang, 1891, of Catholic social teaching. So think of the trickle-up theory. It works. It's, it's what Pope Francis recommends to us. I've seen it work on occasion. And I believe that this parish, especially situated geographically and uh, with a great staff, everything I've seen is so professional, I believe you're well positioned to be, yeah, 
maybe the point, uh, a point, uh, like there's a point guard in basketball, you could be the point guard of environmental awareness in the state of North Carolina, or at least this diocese, and you can point the way for other people to follow. I hope you do. Thank okay. you. Thank you.